Hi all. Today I'm going to talk about an adventure we went on earlier this year. We were lucky enough to be able to make the trip up to Alaska. And while there, we visited the shores of Lake Clark National Park and Preserve, where we got up close and personal with the coastal brown bears. I'm going to discuss how we got to the park, some of the details about the trip, the equipment that I used, and some tips in case you decide to do it yourself. Let's get started. If you follow this channel, you already know that we love to travel, and Alaska's been on our bucket list for a long time. One of the things we were really interested in doing while up there was seeing the coastal brown bears. The coastal brown bears are actually grizzly bears, but their behavior is vastly different. I'll add a disclaimer here, these are wild animals, and with any encounter like this, there's always going to be some inherent danger involved. We did lots of hikes elsewhere inland in Alaska, and we carried bear spray just to be safe. We never had an encounter and never had to use it. Now. Getting up and close and personal with these coastal brown bears is a different scenario entirely, and we were completely out of our element. Here, a knowledgeable and experienced guide is an absolute must. Before I get into this, I'll just note that this video is not sponsored or endorsed by the guide service we used or any of the equipment mentioned. I just want to share our experience with you. Okay, let's get into the actual trip. There's two ways you can get to the shores of Lake Clark National Park, and more specifically, Chinitna Bay. The most common way, and what we thought for a while was the only way to get over there, was by taking a flight scene tour. These tours leave from a few different cities, fly across Cook Inlet, and land on the beach in Chinitna Bay. From there, the guides take the tour groups on a walking tour. One of the added benefits of the flight scene tours is you get some nice scenery of the mountains and some of the volcanoes in the area. I'm sure this would be a great experience, but these were well out of our budget for this trip. Through some additional research, I actually found a second option, which was to take a boat across Cook Inlet. Now, this isn't a boat sized like one of your glacier tours. This is the charter fishing boat that's generally used for fishing for halibut. However, a couple of these guides also offer these bear tours. In fact, there's only a couple of these boats that are even allowed to land on the shores. We chose to go over with Captain Mike from catch -a Charters. They're based out of Homer or Anchor Point, Alaska. After I booked the trip for us, Mike actually called and we talked for quite a while. He was extremely helpful in describing what to expect on the trip and even offered some additional advice about Alaska in general. Now, I'm not knocking the flight scene tours at all, it's just that this trip was right for our family. The price of this trip was far less than the plane tours, and it afforded us a lot more time on the ground with the bears. In fact, we were on the shore for almost three hours. Now, some might consider the two-hour boat ride across Cook Inlet to be a disadvantage. However, for us, it was quite the opposite. We had ample opportunity to enjoy amazing views and spot some sea life along the way. We spotted several sea otters, as well as puffins and other seabirds. A little later in the video, I'll get into the technical aspects of the photography of the bears, as well as what I would suggest to bring along for you. At this point, I'm just going to tell you that all the photos you're seeing here were taken on my EOS R and my Sigma 150-600 contemporary lens. We spent the night before the tour in Homer, Alaska, which is just south of Anchor Point, which is where the tour would leave the next day. We met our guide, Captain Mike, at the boat launch. Getting from the boat launch to the water was an experience like no other. In this area, the boats are boarded while still on their trailers. Then, a large tractor will actually back them into the water and launch the boat right off of the beach. We had a really nice day for crossing Cook Inlet. The waves were probably no more than 3 to 4 feet, and the boat handled them really well. We got really lucky on our timing, because all trips the next day were cancelled. And I suspect it was the same for the flight scene tours, as the reason was really high winds. After crossing the inlet, we arrived at the beach near low tide. However, the tide was just beginning to come in. As the boat stopped in the shallow water, many bears were already in view. We also spotted a couple other tour groups in the distance walking amongst the bears with their respective tour guides. Next, we had to get from the boat to the shore. As the water here was really shallow, probably only a couple of feet, the boat couldn't take us all the way to dry land. So here we had to disembark and get on a smaller dinghy. When the dinghy ran out of water, we had to get out and walk the rest of the way. Now, here's my first important tip. If you're going on one of these tours, you're really going to want knee-length boots that fit really well. One of the members of our household lost her boots in the first few steps of the trip. She had to make the rest of the trek to dry land with her boots in her hand versus on her feet. Now, luckily it was a pretty nice day, but I'm sure some dry feet would have been much more preferable than walking in socks. At this point, I still kept my camera and lenses in the bag, and I would highly suggest you do the same. If you've ever walked through mud, this is the same scenario. It's easy to get a foot stuck and end up tipping over. You don't want to lose your camera gear in the water. Once we hit dry land, or drier land is probably a better term, we were amongst the bears. Our guy did an excellent job of making sure that we did exactly what we were supposed to do to keep us safe. This always involved keeping our group, seven people total, really close together. 
I believe this was to make us appear as a larger animal, and we always walked very slowly. Our guide had excellent situational awareness and made sure that we were always moving away from these bears if they were going to cross towards us. I'll tell you what though, even with that, there's a definite intimidation factor being this close to these huge bears. Most of these bears were a minimum of 100 yards away, some much farther. However, some of the smaller bears, not cubs, came within a few tens of yards away. The only mother with cubs that we saw was several hundred yards in the distance. In case you're wondering, yes, the guides do have a way to scare off bears in case of a close encounter. That provides a little more reassurance when you're in there. As mentioned before, these are actually grizzly bears, but you could not get away with this inland in Alaska, or anywhere else. The coastal brown bears tend to be much larger than their inland counterparts due to the abundance of food. In addition, these bears are much more used to crowded conditions, as was evident by the abundant number of bears everywhere. In general, it seemed the bears didn't even care to look at us. They were busy digging up clams and even catching the occasional fish in the water. I'll say, this was probably one of the most awe-inspiring and surreal experiences we've ever had. Okay, let's get onto the camera gear. As soon as we hit dry land, I had my camera and lens out, ready to go. I had a tripod, tripod head, and a gimbal all packed in my bag. My advice to you on that, leave those back in the car. There was one time near the end of the trip I could have actually used them if I chose to, but in general, you're going to be moving around and you have to be ready to move on a moment's notice. It's not feasible to be using a tripod in that situation. With that being said, I do believe there is some sort of a resort or camp on that same beach that does offer some overnight stays. In that scenario, then you probably would want a tripod or something you could use for longer durations of standing, as I'm sure there'd be plenty of times when you're not walking around on the beach. Another tip on your camera, check and then double check and check again all your camera settings and gear on the boat or plane right over. Then for good measure, check them one more time. I almost always shoot wildlife in manual mode. So I had my ISO, shutter speed, aperture, servo, IS, and focus mode all preset before I even put my camera back in the bag. The reason I emphasize this is some of these shots you may never get this opportunity to take again. Don't risk it. Double check everything. As I mentioned at the beginning, all these photos were taken with my Sigma 150-600 Contemporary. Quite honestly, this is about the perfect lens for this situation. The 60-600 to Sigma would have also probably been pretty useful here. I did use my 24-105 to later on in the trip when we were on really dry land and not moving around. I just wanted to take some panoramic shots as well. I didn't regularly have to use the long end of my telephoto to get good shots. The bears were so abundant that I didn't feel I needed to try to shoot the distant ones. There were plenty of closer bears that filled the full frame and cropping was completely unnecessary. The picture of this bear that came the closest to us was taken at the 150 millimeter end of this lens. And as you can see, even there, I could barely fit it in the frame. If you're enjoying this or other videos, please hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel so I can bring you more tips, tricks, and time savers. If the longest telephoto lens you have is an 80 to 200, you might even be able to get away with that on this trip with some additional cropping. It really depends on the day and some luck and how far away the bears are. I'd say that in general, a 300 millimeter lens or longer would probably be your best bet. Like I mentioned, there was abundant close-up opportunities, but there were a couple times when I wanted to take a photo of maybe a unique bear further in the distance. Also on the first part of this excursion, when you're walking around on the beaches, I wouldn't suggest changing your camera lenses unless you absolutely have to. You really need to be ready to move at any moment per the instructions of your guide, and being mid-lens change would not be a good situation. It's also very muddy and wet, and there's no place to set down your camera gear. You're probably going to end up dropping something, or at least I know I would. So our guide kept working as closer to shore as the tides were coming in. Likewise, the bears were doing the same things as their climbing grounds were getting covered up by water. Once the beach was gone, Captain Mike took us over to a different viewing area where we could watch the bears feeding inland on the grasses. This is the part that I mentioned earlier where the ground is a lot more stable and if you chose to you could actually use a tripod. I found that spouses, traveling partners, and our kids worked as great extra support if I needed to steady my shot a little bit. I never pulled out the tripod. This area offered beautiful panoramas and tons of views of feeding bears. This is the one spot where you could switch out your camera lens if you chose to. I believe earlier I said all the photos that you're going to see were taken on my 150-600, to but there were actually a couple here that I took on my 24-105, to just to get a nice panoramic view. Even in this location, we did have a couple of bears pass pretty close by. But like most of the others, it didn't even acknowledge our presence. Nevertheless, our guide was always vigilant and never let his guard down. At this point of the trip, we were able to talk much more with our guide, who loved to share stories and his knowledge about these bears. Another tip for you, long pants and a long shirt and a mosquito head net are a great idea. That goes for this trip or any other inland hikes you might do in Alaska. We often wore the full mosquito gear on hikes and it was a lifesaver in this situation. Around the three hour mark, or maybe even a little bit before, we were about ready to head out. Our group, which consisted of our family of four, two other travelers, and our captain, all agreed that we were ready to go. 
The first mate of the boat brought the dinghy back to shore and in a couple of trips, we were all back on the main boat. The trip back across the bay was just as pleasant and passed even faster with discussions of the experience we all just had. Upon arrival on the opposite shore, we pulled right back onto the trailer and were pulled back to the parking lot. Now, I thought at this point our day was over, but we had a nice bonus surprise at the end. We spotted throngs of eagles on the beaches nearby. They were all really preoccupied with the dead fish and didn't even care that we were there. This offered some fantastic photo opportunities. We probably spent another half an hour or so just snapping photos and watching these birds before we headed to our next destination. Here in Wisconsin, where we live, we don't often get to see eagles like this. I love trying to capture eagles in flight. but this sort of scenario we don't see. This was a very different opportunity for these photos and I loved every minute of it. It was a perfect ending for the day. I'll try to do some more videos in the future about some other Alaskan adventures we had there, as well as share some of the photography tips that go along with them. Again, I'll put the link in the description to the charter that we took for this experience, in case that's something that interests you. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you next time.